Well, good afternoon, and thanks again for being here and for watching and listening from home. Today, I want to talk to you about alternative care sites as we prepare for our surge capacity, personal protective equipment, also referred to as PPE, and our census. I want to start today with our fundamental message, stay home. On Monday, I ordered Virginians to do just that, to stay home except for necessary trips out for supplies, medical reasons, work, or to care for another person or animal. I know this is difficult and many sacrifices are being made, but the sooner we can put this health crisis behind us, the sooner our lives will return to normal and the sooner our economy will rebound. That executive order lasts until June the 10th as does our emergency declaration, unless the situation changes enough for me to lift it early, and I hope that it does. That's longer than most other states. I want Virginians to be realistic in their expectations. You need to know the truth, no sugarcoating. I know this is hard. People are isolated. You're worried and many of you are out of work. My strategy has always been to plan for the worst and to hope for the best. Again, I know that this is very difficult for everyone, and I want Virginians to prepare themselves for the long haul. We are talking months, not weeks. While we continue to examine the available models about when Virginia's cases will surge. We currently expect that will be sometime between late April and late May. I am already thinking and planning on how we can land this plane on the backside of the curve. But for now, we are at the beginning of this virus, and that is why it is so important for Virginians to stay at home. If we can all stay home, we don't give the virus the chance to infect the next person. We slow it down. To expand on this just a bit, the virus can't live by itself. It needs people like you and me referred to as hosts for it to survive and to spread. So what we are talking about is making it as difficult as possible for the virus to latch on to a host. The CDC called social distancing a powerful weapon, so let's use it. We've gotten a lot of questions about exactly what this stay at home order means. It means stay at home. Don't go out if you don't need to. Don't go out because you're bored. Go out when you need to and when you, not when you want to. The more people that stay home, the fewer people that will get sick. But make no mistake, we are preparing for the people who will get sick. We've been working with the United States Army Corps of Engineers on potential sites for alternative hospital beds. They've now evaluated 41 sites across our Commonwealth. We've narrowed that down to the Exxon Mobil facility in Fairfax, which is literally next door to a Nova Fairfax hospital, the Hampton Convention Center, which is in close proximity to Santerra and Riverside hospitals and is central to Hampton Roads, and a site in the Richmond area. We'll have a decision and more information on that in Friday's briefing. Also today, we have received a third shipment of PPE from the national stockpile. That includes face shields, gowns, and masks, but we need more. We continue to work all available options for getting more personal protective equipment for our frontline medical personnel. I have also heard questions about upcoming elections. During the duration of this stay at home order, Virginia is scheduled to hold two elections local elections in May, and congressional primaries in June. I consider elections 
to be a fundamental democratic event and voting to be an essential right. We are continuing to work through the best options for how to hold these elections in this time of social distancing and public health concerns. In the meantime, I encourage Virginians to use absentee voting to vote by mail. It is easy to request a ballot by mail and return it by mail. For those who live alone, you can ask a neighbor to witness you signing it at a safe distance. Elections are vitally important, and we will ensure that they are held. Now I'll turn it over to our Virginia Health Commissioner, Dr. Norm Oliver, for an update on the numbers and also on how our modeling efforts are going. Dr. Oliver, thank you. Thank you, Governor. Yes, sir. Good afternoon. The numbers on uh, the COVID-19 cases, as you know, are updated each morning at 9 a.m. on our VDH website. Today, we have a total number of cases of 1,484. That represents 234 new cases since we reported on this uh, yesterday. The total deaths from COVID-19 are 34, which is seven more than the prior 24-hour period. We continue to have a cluster of a high number of cases in Northern Virginia, in Arlington, Fairfax, Loudoun, Loudoun counties, as well as uh, Prince William County, and in Central Virginia here in Henrico and Chesterfield, as well as the peninsula, uh, a number of cities and counties in that area. There are 305 COVID-19 patients who are currently hospitalized across the Commonwealth. 145 of them are in ICU beds, and 108 are in ventilator support. The governor uh, mentioned that we are working on modeling. Uh, there are a number of models in existence, as you are all are, are aware. Uh, more than a month ago, Imperial College in London published the model. Uh, there's models from the University of Washington, from the University of Pennsylvania. Um, here in uh, the Commonwealth, the University of Virginia, um, uh, uh, at the Data Science Institute there, uh, researchers have built a model that's being used by the Defense um, uh, Threat Reduction Agency. Uh, they have uh, agreed to work with us and have been working us, with us over the last couple of weeks. And uh, we will, in uh, just uh, a few days, be able, I think, to present a model that has Virginia-specific uh, data, which will therefore be a much more accurate uh, projection on what we can expect here in the Commonwealth. And we'll report on that when that uh, becomes fully operational. Thank you. April the 1st is Census Day in the United States. Although census takers won't be going door to door because of social distancing, it remains vitally important that Virginians fill out the census forms they've received through the mail. You can do that by mail or online. Getting an accurate count of everyone living in Virginia will ensure that we get our full share of federal funding for a variety of programs. That will be even more critical as we work to recover from the impacts of this pa pandemic. I'd like to ask our Deputy Secretary of the Commonwealth, Tracy DeShazer, to speak briefly about the census. Tracy, thank you. Thank you, Governor, for allowing me to be here on Census Day and to take a moment to remind everyone how important it is for every person living in Virginia to be counted in the 2020 census. The census is a population count, and it's been conducted every 10 years since 1790. Census data is used to determine how federal funding is distributed to states and how many seats each state will have in Congress. Additionally, it helps communities shape public safety planning and more. The results of the census will impact each of our lives for the next 10 years, and so I'm here to ask each of you to take just 10 minutes today to fill out your census. Over the next few weeks, each household across Virginia received a letter with instructions to fill out the census. For the first time, you can now complete the census online by visiting 2020census.gov, by phone or by mail. 
Everyone, including children ages zero to five, undocumented residents, everyone should be included and complete their census. By law, all census responses are completely confidential and your information cannot be shared. It can't be shared with law enforcement or anyone else. Additionally, the census will not ask you for your social security number, your bank account information, political affiliation, or citizenship status. Your responses are protected by law, and it will only be used for statistical purposes. Again, census data is used to, to determine how more than $675 billion in federal funding is allocated. This includes programs such as Medicaid and Medicare Part B, SNAP, WIC, housing vouchers, school lunches and breakfasts, community health centers, Pell Grants, and federal student loans. We can't afford to have Virginians not be counted and lose out on critical funding to support our communities. Thank you to the efforts by the governor and the Virginia Complete Count Commission, as well as Virginians who have already responded to their census. And currently, we're an eighth in the nation for self-response so far, with more than 40% of households in Virginia having already responded. So please visit 2020census.gov or call 844-320-2020 and take 10 minutes a day to fill out your census. Also, important, the phone number that you can also text us for, to ask questions is 804-203-0393. Thank you. I want to reiterate that I know all of this is hard on everyone. And I thank all of you for the way you're handling this situation. Today is the first of the month, which means rent or mortgage payments are due. And for many Virginians, that comes just after they are being laid off or furloughed due to this pandemic. I encourage all of those Virginians to apply for unemployment. That will at least provide some help. For those who have federal mortgage loans through the Virginia Housing Department Authority, we're deferring loan payments for up to three months if people need it. We're also suspending evictions for anyone with public housing vouchers. On March the 16th, I asked the Virginia Supreme Court to declare a statewide judicial emergency, which they did. By suspending non-emergency court proceedings, we also suspended eviction proceedings through April the 26th. April also brings important religious holidays. This weekend, Christians will celebrate Palm Sunday. Next week is Good Friday and then Easter Sunday. For the Jewish faith, Passover begins next week. For Muslims, Ramadan starts later this month. Buddhists and Hindus have religious holidays coming up as well. These are important times for faith communities, and normally they would be celebrated together. I am a man of faith. In times like these, many of us draw strength from our church and our faith. During these times, our faith is more important than ever. But for the safety of everyone, we need to find other ways to celebrate our faith right now. Online sermons are a good way to help sustain that connection. Drive-in services where everyone remains in their own vehicles are another option. On Friday, we'll have further guidelines and suggestions from our faith leaders. Yes, we have some people who are not following social distancing rules, and to me that is frustrating. But we have so many more Virginians who are, and to all of you out there that are, I say thank you. We have frontline workers, from our medical staff to our grocery workers, to the folks in our school divisions delivering food to students who are working every day to help other people. We have people sewing masks, signing up for our volunteer medical corps, looking for ways to help out. We had people in Northern Virginia who raised money to buy laptops for students, and they donated those with hotspots and prepaid cards to get internet access to students all the way on the other side of the Commonwealth in Bristol. I can't tell you enough, Virginia, how much we appreciate 
everyone who is stepping up. If all you're doing is staying home, that in of itself is a contribution. And I thank you. We are all in this together. Thank you, and we'll be happy to take your questions. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. All right. Um, my question is a lot of homeless people and homeless advocates are concerned about how the stay-at-home order affects them. A lot of localities don't have shelters that are open all day throughout the year, and homeless people, I've heard, are concerned about the possibility of being punished for not having a home to go to. So I was wondering if there is a statewide plan for assisting homeless people during this time. Thank you, Governor. Uh, we, we are cognizant of the challenges on the homeless population, and we're working uh, with uh, Secretary Lane to secure financing to find places for folks who, who are homeless. Uh, we don't want them uh, in, a homeless situa in, a, in a homeless situation because uh, it, it makes them more vulnerable to disease. So we are, we are, excuse me, we are working on solutions for that. One about PPE, when you say that we still need more, how much more do we need specifically, and where are we seeing the biggest shortages? And then also, I know that the Virginia Hospital and Healthcare Association sent a letter requesting that military and veterans hospitals open up for surge capacity. I was wondering if the state was aware of this and, you know, whether the administration had a response to that request. I'm going to let Secretary Kerry address that, but just to start, the question is how much PPE do we need? We need as much as we can get, bottom line. Uh, there's no such thing as too much right now. And, and what has prompted that uh, is, uh, as we have said every day, and, and I speak on behalf of all of our governors, um, we're competing with each other. We're competing with other countries. We're, we're competing with other states. And, and so while uh, individuals have stepped up, businesses have stepped up, people are making things, uh, manufacturing, PPEs uh, right here in Virginia, uh, we still uh, uh, we lack in the total number we need. And I, as I, I mentioned, Kate, uh, uh, a few conferences ago, uh, an ICU patient who is in isolation, uh, so many individuals have to, to visit to care for that patient, and we just literally burn through PPE uh, to the tune of maybe 240 sets of PPE per patient. A day, so you multiply that uh, as uh, as was said earlier. The number of individuals we have in hospitals now, the the number of individuals that are in ICUs that are on ventilators, it just you go through a lot of PPE. So, Dan, sure. Uh, thank you, Governor. I, I think actually the governor did an excellent job, uh, really answering the question. Uh, I will simply add that uh, we understand that there's an incredible demand out there, and we're trying to make sure that our frontline workers of all types have access to the PPE they need. Uh, we also acknowledge that those that are around patients, for example, that have a, a breathing tube in and are getting suctioned and, and being intubated who are critically ill, that is a particular time where they're, it's at highest risk for a healthcare worker or a frontline uh, worker to be exposed. So clearly that group is a priority, but we also know there's, there's great needs across the Commonwealth. And, uh, Dr. Oliver and the, the team at the VEST are taking all those supplies and allocating them based on inventories and based on our, our knowledge of where the needs are. And that, and I'm, I'm learning day by day that that is changing. Um, several weeks ago, for example, our hospitals had uh, a number of weeks, but what we're hearing more and more is those hospitals, as they go through the, the care of patients, as the governor outlined, they are burning through that supply. So we are... It, uh, getting uh, requests uh, from all quarters, and we are, uh, together with the VEST as well as uh, Secretary of Commerce and Trade and his team, exploring are there manufacturing, and that's starting to occur here in Virginia, and we're also, just like everybody else, going to where we can to get what our, what our frontline workers need. I think there was a question about military hospitals, yeah. and I was going to defer to, if it's all right, Governor, to Secretary Hopkins for Veterans and Military Affairs. hospitals expanding their capacity and then what we're doing in addition with the sites that we're talking about. Sure thing. Th thank you, Governor. Uh, uh, 
as we are uh, looking at what the demand is going to be in the Commonwealth and all of those curves that Dr. Oliver mentioned that give us a range of possibilities, they're not a crystal ball by any means, we are working to, with the, the, the health care systems of Virginia, and we are so blessed to have tremendous health care systems and hospitals in Virginia. And they've been working on their surge capacity uh, at what they can do on site or near site and uh, sharing that on a day to day basis with the Virginia Emergency Support Team. And then beyond that, we are exploring what are those sites that would be helpful to set up. Uh, hospital services, again, not independent because we are dependent on personnel from the health care systems augmented by the Virginia Reserve Corps and other volunteers to staff any additional treatment sites. So the governor outlined that we are in the process of looking at Northern Virginia here around uh, Richmond as well as in Tidewater, their population centers, to see where those sites make sense to fit with the surge capacities of our hospitals in a true public-private partnership. Governor? Sure. And then uh, Secretary Hobbs. Sure. Thank you, Carlos. It's okay. Your question was about military hospitals and specifically the letter from the Health Care Association. And we are aware of that letter and, and the request to Secretaries Esper and Wilkie. Uh, I would just start by saying we've been in communication with the military hospitals and facilities in the Commonwealth for several weeks. I've spoken personally with the commanders at uh, Portsmouth Naval Hospital as well as the Belvoir Hospital. I've also spoken with the directors of the VA hospitals here in the Commonwealth. Uh, and they are engaged in, in similar exercises in, in suspending elective op, uh, procedures as well as preparing for the surge, a potential surge in their own provision of health care. Um, obviously, with the number of veterans and active duty military we have in Virginia, uh, we understand their primary mission. But they're also positioning themselves that in the event we need to ask for those additional resources, they're prepared to provide whatever services they can as well while serving that military and veteran population. Thank you. Thank you, Carla. All right, next will be Max Smith from WTOP. Hi, yes, good afternoon. Um, I'm following up on the field hospitals question. Uh, if there are all these concerns about protective equipment and staffing, even if you can set up the site, are the protective equipment and the doctors and the nurses and the other staff needed to actually run them going to be available and where would they come from and how long would that take to set up? The, the question was what about uh, these alternative care sites? Don't we still have the challenges of PPE? If we're able to put the call out as the governor has for additional volunteers of nurses, of doctors, of respiratory therapists, of volunteers of all type, and we organize them, aren't we still going to have the limiting issue of, of uh, personal protective equipment? And the answer is, if that supply does not increase, we will indeed have that same constraint. There's, the, the goal is to have no PPE constraint four weeks, five weeks, six weeks, that range of of, of uh, peak demand in Virginia that is uh, projected, we have to have more PPE. And that's uh, the health systems and the, and the doctors, those supply chains are, are uh, being used, but there's not a lot in that, that those supply chains currently. So we're looking for production in Virginia. We're also looking to the federal government. And there's no question that if PPE supplies aren't dramatically increased in the weeks ahead, though we will not be able to protect the current healthcare workers in their current setting, let alone expanded capacity. So PPE remains a critically important issue. Okay. Uh, Governor, we're starting to hear from some counties now about concerns about their finances going forward, that they're gonna have revenue shortfalls. Uh, we've heard uh, from the Virginia Municipal League uh, about their concerns and asking whether the state would reconsider or hold off on the, mm -hmm. the raising the minimum wage. Do you have any thoughts on those issues and what this is going to do to the budget going forward? Just, Greg, a couple, I think there are a couple parts to your question on m municipalities, uh, uh, pieces of legislation like minimum wage. And uh, before I turn this over to our Secretary of Finance, Aubrey Lane, uh, there are a number of pieces of legislation 
uh, that we're looking at uh, regarding our, our business environment, um, and I haven't made any definite decisions, but we are talking to the patrons of, of those pieces of legislation and, and, uh, and talking to people across Virginia, uh, business leaders, uh, folks from the union, uh, workers, uh, labor, uh, all of these individuals. To, and I, what I will do is uh, collectively, after getting uh, input from these individuals, uh, make a decision that's in the best interest of, of Virginia and the best interest of our, our economy. Uh, regarding the funding for municipalities, I'll let Secretary Lane address that. Thank you. Thank you, Governor. Um, yes, uh, Greg, just uh, as you know, just like municipalities, our revenues are being hit very hard also. Um, uh, and so every action we take in to date has been in support of, as you heard Dr. Carey and others talking about getting the protective uh, equipment that our first-line responders need, our hospitals need. So a lot of resources put to there. There are a lot of calls on the Commonwealth to delay certain types of taxes. I'll remind people your question about localities, many of those taxes go to those localities. So on the other side of that, we're getting the request from them, please don't delay anymore because we need that money here. It's an uh, unprecedented event. Uh, the governor has always said that it was going to be public health. We had to get that right. And then we have an economic crisis on the other side. You've seen Secretary Ball up here talking about the impact uh, how we're trying to get equipment, but also our businesses. So we're trying to balance that. But within all of this, we must keep a balanced budget. And, of course, uh, we have a year end coming up in about uh, three months. The fourth quarter is very important to us. The last thing we need to do is to have the governor have to take some action because we don't meet a revenue projection that forces him to take action to reduce state uh, government at a time when it's needed the most. So that's the balancing act we're going through. As the governor mentioned, there's a lot of different requests, a lot of different strategies. I can assure you all those talks are going on with our General Assembly members. Um, but until uh, we get through and making sure we get the resources that everybody needs for this public health, that's being worked on, but that will take the back seat uh, to, to what's going on up front. Thank you. Thank you. David McGee with the Bristol Herald Courier. Uh -huh. Yes, thank you. Governor, I wanted to follow up. You mentioned uh, the upcoming elections. I wanted to follow up on that because candidates obviously cannot hold uh, large events for supporters or to raise funds. Do you have any guidance for candidates uh, in this unprecedented time that we're in? You know, it's a great question. And I uh, get to counting. I've guess, run in six uh, campaigns uh, over the years. And uh, Times are different. Um, I mean, going out and giving stump speeches in front of crowds and uh, fundraisers. I mean, you could go right down the list. I mean, we're we're living in a new day, and and I think uh, you know those candidates, uh, especially those that are going to be successful, are going to really have to be innovative. Uh, they're going to have to think outside the box. Uh, how they can use social media. All of these things are going to be important. But um, you know, I'm. I'm thankful that I don't. I'm not running in an election uh, anytime soon, uh, so uh, I don't really have any advice for those individuals right now. My my efforts, uh, uh, as you might imagine, are are taking care of the Commonwealth right now, and that's that's what I'll continue to focus on. Yeah, um, now that we know that inmates and staff members have tested positive, how is that changing the Department of Corrections' approach, making sure people are isolated and that's not spreading sure. as much as possible? And do you guys have a follow, um, an update on the number of inmates that have been released in uh, accordance with your new criteria? Well, Secretary Moran or uh, Secretary of Public Safety, thank you. Uh, the question is with respect to uh, the recent news that uh, we did have inmates test positive as well as staff members. The, uh, at, at this time, there are two facilities particularly impacted of the 41. And what DOC is doing is uh, following the CDC guidelines. The, you know, we, because of the community spread is occurring, uh, we certainly hope for the best but prepared for the worst. And DOC is implementing the plans uh, with respect to that eventuality, and um, they're going to follow the guidelines. So, and those guidelines dictate uh, quarantine and and contact investigations. So we find out who may have been in contact with those individuals and we'll provide them guidance with respect to quarantining as well. So um, it's modified lockdown at the two facilities and that limits uh, any movement by the inmates, but we still want to allow them 
out uh, for recreation during the course of the day. So like, once again, uh, DOC has plans in place and they're um, implementing those plans and doing everything they can to prevent any further spread. Thanks. So did Sharon say that you were following the guidelines that you were following before and nothing new has happened now that they've tested positive necessarily? Well, sure. What's new is we're following the CDC guidelines for those positive tests. Before we didn't have any positive tests. We were restricting movements, but now that that has uh, occurred, we're going to follow the CDC guidelines with respect to positive tests. And, and you did ask a subsequent question about release, and you know, in response to other questions, I've been telling you from this podium how uh, our parole board has been working overtime, and they really have been, and uh, and because of that. Um, they have uh, released the March date, having concluded yesterday, they released 96 individuals on parole. That represents a 153% increase from the previous month. Now, I want to make sure uh, that the viewers and listeners know we are still considering public safety, which is extremely important in these times, and that consideration is part of the decision the parole board is making, but because of uh, this crisis and the direction the governor has given us, you know, we're, we're asking them to take a second look and third and fourth look. And because of that, they've, they've uh, increased uh, the parole release uh, percentage. Luann Rice with the Roanoke Times. Uh, yes, of the 41 alternative sites that were evaluated by the U.S. Corp Army Corps of Engineers, were any of them west of Richmond? And are you thinking that there's enough capacity within the health systems in the other regions of Virginia that they won't need the military hospital? I'm going to ask Secretary Hopkins to address that. Thank you, sir. With respect to your first question, uh, I believe you asked of the 41 sites how many were west of Richmond. Uh, the way the Corps, working in, in conjunction with the Department of Health and the National Guard, We've looked at sites and looked at where we see the greatest need and potential impact on hospital capacity. And so that's how we've prioritized the Northern Virginia region, as well as the Hampton Roads region and the Central Virginia region. I will add, however, the team is conducting assessments west of Richmond uh, and will start heading out to Charlottesville and Roanoke next week. Uh, with respect to the second part of your question regarding capacity, and I'm going to have to defer to, to, to Dr. Carey regarding the capacity aspect. Uh, but it is the anticipation of the military hospitals that they will be prepared to address surge capacity within the military hospitals and continue to coordinate with the local health systems as to whether there are any additional needs. But I'll defer to Dr. Carey on the capacity. So the question really was around uh, capacity and how did capacity uh, lead to uh, focusing on the high population areas? And I, I, the, the reason is because that as you look at the spread of this disease, it's the air areas that are going to get it fast and, and most the soonest that have the highest likelihood of exceeding their supply, uh, their access to hospital beds, for example. So I think it's, it's really important to, to focus on those areas that from the, the models as well as from the surge capacity that the health systems can do on their own with, with assistance, but not a new site, that, that comparing that supply and demand uh, led to those areas being focused on first. Going back to the Department of Corrections, I just wanted to get a sense of, are, are y'all satisfied with that progress? Uh, a little less than 100 uh, inmates released in a system of, I believe, over 15,000. Um, are y'all where you need to be, you feel like, in terms of being able to handle this? The question is, are we satisfied with the uh, Pro Board's work? And, and I'd respond, again, that we do not have parole in Virginia. And those who are in our, one of our 41 state facilities are there because they received a sentence of more than two years. So you know, I, I've, I've heard from advocates, I've heard from family members, I'm reading your emails, and uh, we have a great sympathy and empathy toward their concern for their families and, or, uh, you know, the, that are incarcerated. We are doing everything we can. I know DOC is doing everything we can they can to ensure their safety. They are being monitored regularly. Um, 
And, but the system, when you ask a question like that, you have, I, I want to make sure that everybody understands the system. Most in those who are transient or have low level offenses, nonviolent offenses, which some states are reviewing and, and we're reviewing, but they're typically in the local jail, not the state prison. Those are longer sentences, typically more serious crimes. So, uh, Ned Dancer, we are looking each and every one of those, and we've asked the parole board to look, and we're reviewing it, but I, I do want you to appreciate the system by which we have to operate in terms of releasing. And the parole board has released 90, 95 individuals, which represents a substantial increase from the month before. That reflects our seriousness with respect to uh, responding to this crisis. Jails. I've heard uh, frustration from, uh, and I think the Criminal Defense Attorney Association sent a letter to y'all about this today, um, that it's been very inconsistent across jurisdictions and even between judges as to whether or not they feel like they should reconsider sentences for some of these uh, nonviolent low-level offenses um, or even bail decisions. Uh, we're hearing in the same courthouses judges uh, coming to different conclusions about whether or not someone should be released for the, for the, in the same circumstances. Um, I, I've heard them ask uh, for, for you all to sort of clarify that, like how you think or would like judges uh, and prosecutors to be handling those kinds of cases. Uh, the question is with respect to how the criminal justice system is responding to this generally, how they're responding to this crisis, particularly judges, prosecutors, law enforcement. And I, I will say I am in touch with sheriffs and members of that law enforcement community and our public safety officials regularly. I mean, daily, uh, you know, uh, on the phone with them and in contact with their uh, association representatives as well. What I am hearing is they are responding. They are responding responsibly. Uh, they are releasing um, low-level offenders and not allowing some of them even to come into the system by use of what's called a summons by law enforcement, not even introducing them before a magistrate or into the criminal justice system. So uh, the, we believe the governor's guidance has been quite direct and forceful um, to all concerned. Uh, particularly the criminal justice system, and we are monitoring their efforts, and, uh, and uh, I think it has actually been a, a very positive response. They're, they're responding very, very well and understand the significance and importance of the distancing and trying to reduce those, the, increase the capacity in our jails so that if one were to have a positive test, they could implement the CDC guidelines. Many, and the sheriffs I've spoken to, the capacity they really have um, increased p capacity by reducing population. Virginia Beach, I think, is about 50 percent. I was on the phone with uh, the sheriff in, in Fairfax just recently. They have reduced uh, their population so to increase capacity for those, you know, if, if in case they do have a positive that they can uh, follow the CDC guidelines. Jessica Jewell with WSLS in, in, in Roanoke. Hey, good afternoon. Here in Southwest Virginia, we have a smaller number of cases. Is this because of testing limitations, a backlog in testing, or are people in Southwest Virginia adhering to social distancing? I don't know. The question is in Southwest Virginia why we have uh, a smaller number of, of uh, individuals that are testing positive. I, you know, I, I think that uh, it's fair to say that uh, we're seeing the highest increase, uh, highest number of, of positives in dense populations across Virginia, uh, certainly in, in rural uh, Virginia, and I, I am from rural Virginia. We, we tend to look, be a little bit more spread out uh, uh, and don't uh, gather in, in large groups. And so um, I think that's part of the reason for that. Uh, as far as the testing capabilities, uh, when individuals uh, have symptoms, if they've traveled, if they've had contacts, uh, et cetera, uh, they're going through the same screening uh, mechanism, and if they meet those criteria, then they're being tested. But I think it, a lot of your question, uh, you know, it, it is related to the, the decrease or the less population uh, in our rural areas of Virginia. Yeah. Um, yeah, quickly, do you have a sense 
terms of the state level of enforcement on the 10 person gathering ban, and second about testing, given that the state's capacity has grown, are there any changes to the criteria, who is prioritized? My question is, if we have more tests, what are we doing with that uh, larger capacity? Yeah, the, a couple questions, Mel. The, the first was about enforcement. and. And I, I think that uh, in talking to a, a lot of our, our law enforcement uh, agencies across Virginia, they are uh, taking this very seriously. Uh, we have had discussions with them, uh, for example, uh, in Hampton Roads uh, after what we saw this past weekend. And so uh, I would just encourage Virginians to take this seriously as well and to know that if they don't abide by the, the 10 or less uh, rules, uh, that they are uh, uh, at risk of, of – uh, uh, receiving a citation and, and, and a, a class one misdemeanor. Uh, so, so hopefully that answers that. And the second part of your question was uh, about, about the testing. Dr. Tony, is it, maybe if you just kind of give us an update on where we are with, with testing. Thanks for that. Yeah, I think she, they were asking about yeah, let me, Okay. Um, if I understand your uh, question correctly, you're really asking about the criteria that we use for uh, testing, and the criteria has been set by the uh, Virginia Department of Health. It's been broadened since the beginning of this uh, uh, pandemic, uh, but we still have um, a limited number of tests. We've, we've had expansion in that number, but it's not at the level where we can just do broad based, population-based testing. So we have focused in on those areas uh, and populations that are at highest risk so that we can identify cases there quickly and do the contact investigation. And at this point, we haven't uh, envisioned changing those criteria. So you're asking whether or not we might expand from beyond just nursing homes to the uh, elderly population in general. And what we focused on is on those who are in the, as you've seen from around the country, nursing home facilities, assisted living facilities, and hospitals have been the places where the most, uh, uh, the highest risk patients have uh, been. And those are the areas that we're focusing on, and um, we'll continue to do that for the foreseeable future. Thank you. So the question was about testing capacity, and we did have one significant change this week. Um, the state laboratory completed our evaluations of automation and being able to run larger batches, and we were able to double our throughput um, per day testing. So prior to this week, we were processing or had at capacity to run about 100 patients a day with reporting out those results same day, and now we have doubled that capacity, which came timely in the fact that we're seeing more community spread as well as we're seeing increasing outbreaks in nursing homes, in institutional settings, and in other communities. And so our ability to process double the number of patients in a day allows public health to respond more rapidly to those outbreak and emerging disease situations. So right now we have, um, uh, we're still receiving reagents in. Um, we got a shipment in yesterday and we have um, a, over about 2,000 tests in-house and we're expecting more reagents in this week. Kate, I think just to, to follow up, as we get closer to the peak when, when we're really looking at the, the surge, which again we predict to be uh, in May at some point, the, the amount of testing, and I commend all that's been done with testing uh, in Virginia and also with PPE, but uh, we still need uh, more efficient, more effective testing as we get into that peak time because that will not only help us know who's sick, who's at risk, but it also let us know about our staff. Uh, have, have they been exposed? Are they healthy? So, so a lot is going on in the area of testing. Uh, as you know, uh, we're talking about a 15 or 20 minute turnaround now that, that is in the pipeline. 
uh, to look at antibody testing to see if someone has had it in the past. And, and so that uh, uh, is very important. Also, again, as I mentioned earlier, the more PPE that we have, the better as we go into that surge. And then the testing will be especially helpful as we come off of the curve, as we start making decisions uh, when we can get back to, to life as we used to know it. And so, so we are working every day to improve both our access to testing as well as the PPE. Thank you all so much for being here today and uh, appreciate everybody's cooperation uh, in Virginia. And as I've, I've said, I, I know these are difficult times for Virginians. They're difficult for all of us. We are all making sacrifices, but uh, Virginia uh, is the best state and the best country in the world and, and we're strong and we're gonna get through this together. So uh, hang in there and uh, we will look forward to speaking to you on, on Friday. Thank you very much.